And then finally, I have the privilege of welcoming our guest speaker up to continue our affirmation series. So if everyone would give Spencer Meyer a round of applause. To see what do we believe? What are the things that, that this church holds true to? And so I get to talk this week on affirmation number three. Before we get going, though, uh, our, our old pastor, he always started by telling you about sports and his favorite college. Um, my favorite college is not uh, WSU, it is GCU, Grand Canyon University. And I just need to tell you, last night on MLB Network, you might have seen the season opener where GCU Antelopes took down number two Tennessee Volunteers. So, big win on opening night. Yes, I know we, you're not all GCU fans, but... Uh, this morning we can be. Um, let's start by praying. I'll take a, take a page out of Cesar's book. I think it's always good to start with a prayer. So, dear Lord, um, we ask that you would just bless this time. Please um, have your hand on this message, and may these be your words um, that you speak, not mine, um, because we all know that I'm far from the one who should be preaching this message. But uh, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. And again, we just ask you to bless this time and, and allow it to be fruitful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So affirmation number three, we're going to start by reading it to you. I, what does it say? Um, we affirm a commitment to the whole mission of the church. The early covenanters were known as mission friends, people of shared faith who came together to carry out God's mission both far and near. Mission for them and for us includes evangelism, Christian formation, and ministries of compassion, mercy, and justice. We follow Christ's two central calls. The Great Commission sends us out into the world to make disciples, and the Great Commandments call us to love the Lord our God and our neighbors as ourselves. So um, if you would, if you have a Bible or an app, you can open to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. This is the Great Commission. This is where Jesus is sending out his disciples, and he tells them this is what you are to do. I'm not going to be here uh, much longer, and so you've been really used to following me around while I teach and I heal and I, I do all these great things. I, I've uh, gathered quite the following. Um, you guys are examples of that. And he says to them, now it is your turn. So I'll pick up uh, in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That last, um, that last piece there is uh, very encouraging, especially knowing that, hey, we've got to obey all that you've commanded me? Well, you've, you've, you've commanded me to do some kind of scary stuff, some stuff I'm not very comfortable with. But Jesus says, rest assured, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Our mission as the church is to make disciples. And how do we do that? Um, by obeying God's greatest commandments. One, to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And two, by loving your neighbor as yourself. That's Matthew 22, 36 through 40. I think it's up on the screen if you want to follow along there. But uh, one of the Pharisees asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law, not just the Ten Commandments that we are familiar with, but all 613 laws that are in the Old Testament and the words of the prophets hang on just these two um, commandments. And so um, Jesus also tells us that those who love him will keep his commandments. And so my question for us today is, are we missional-minded believers seeking to make disciples of all the nations, or are we perhaps just a little bit lethargic? Um, it is not enough to be hearers of the word only, James tells us in, in chapter 1. James 
Uh, it's not certain who wrote it, but most scholars agree that the book of James was probably written by the half-brother of Jesus, who grew up with Jesus, who doubted Jesus, um, and didn't, didn't fully believe that he was actually the Messiah um, until much later. But then he goes on, writes, and, and is pretty clearly on fire for Christian living. In, in, verse, uh, in chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, he says, Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it is like someone who looks into a mirror and sees his face, walks away, and then forgets what he looked like. Some of you might see me and think, he forgot what he looked like this morning. But it's just how I look. I tried fixing it, but um, I think next, next time I am up here, we'll give a message on head coverings so that we don't have to all see this. My girlfriend is like, you make a joke every time you're up there about being bald. And I'm like, I just want people to know that I see it too. Like, we all see it. We can all see right through to my scalp. And I want you to know that you're not the only ones. Okay, so um, if you look in the mirror and walk away and forget what you just saw, what you look like, what good was it to even look in the mirror? In the same way, um, if, if Jesus saving you, if you say that you're a Christian, if, if Jesus saved you, and it has had no impact on your life, if I can't tell the difference between who you were before Christ and who you are after Christ, then what good is that faith? What was the point of looking in the mirror? What was the point of believing in Jesus and accepting him as your Savior? Now, have you ever said or known somebody that says they're going to do something, they don't actually do it? A lot of you just looked over at your husbands. Um... Politicians are a good example. I was promised that my student debt was being forgiven. It's still there. Um, my own weight loss journey. Who knows how many years I've been trying to lose weight. Probably the last five and all that's happened is I've gained 20 pounds. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I really just struggle to do it. I'm like, I can't do it. Even in writing this sermon, I knew... I was supposed to write the sermon. I had four weeks to write the sermon. And much like when I was in college and I had the syllabus from the start of the semester, still I would wait until the night before to put it together because I cannot operate unless it's crunch time and I'm under pressure. That's how diamonds are formed, my friends. Um, Faith and deeds. We're going to jump now um, in your Bibles over to James chapter 2. And it's a, it's a section on um, faith and deeds, faith and works, you might hear it called. Um, and this is where some people are like, Ooh, my guard's up. And if your guard has just gone up, good, um, because we do not, not want to be legalists here. So, let's, uh, but, so hear me through. Picking up in vor- verse 14, so James 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Well, show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds." So, Spencer, is this a contradiction to what Paul says? I seem to remember that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, this is a ver- these are verses that I cling to as well. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works. What? So that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we're not saved by works, but James is saying, what the heck? You you can't have faith without works. Is that a contradiction? It's not a contradiction. Here is why. I think they're saying two parts of the same thing. I was um, in Oregon uh, last week for um, work, and one of my, one of my, uh, the counselors on my team, he said, I was telling him that I was preparing for this message, because although I did not put pen to paper until the day before, I was thinking about it. That's how I kind of operate. Um, I, was, I said, okay, this is, this is what I'm, I'm planning on doing. 
I'm going to, I want to talk about how we should be mission-minded believers and that we, it's not simply enough to just show up to church and listen to the Word and go out and not, not have even a changed life and not seek to uh, create more disciples with that, not to share the knowledge. Um, so we have to do something with it. As I said, I'm going to talk about James chapter 2, and, and maybe that's confusing. He goes, Spencer, I grew up Catholic, and that has always been really confusing for me because I have struggled with, like, I need to do all this good stuff. I need to do all this good stuff. And I I kept getting it confused with being saved, and that I thought that's, I had to do stuff to get saved, but it's just faith. So those two sides of the coin that Paul and James are, are talking about is, Paul is saying, you are saved by grace through faith, okay? That's it. That's how you're saved. But that faith that saved you should also produce good work in your life. And so they're not, um, you're not saved by the works. The faith that saved you then produces the works. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're all on the same page. This is not legalism. We are called to bear fruit, not just fluff. Um, Let's jump over to John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 17. So John chapter 15, I think it's up on the, it is. So Tom, this morning, when I changed some verses on him, he said, Spencer, why do you have so many last minute changes? But can we give him a round of applause real quick for just being so great and working with us difficult people. Uh, this is about the vine and the branches. He, he, Jesus is talking to him. He's in the upper room with his disciples. This is, um, I think, in my understanding, this is the same night as uh, the, the Passover meal that they've, they've been doing, and he had cleaned their feet, and they're, they're lounging at the table talking about things, um, as this is, this is one of Jesus' last night with the disciples. He tells them, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And in the Greek, that word can also mean cleans, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean or pruned because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Some of you might have, we'll pause right here, some of you might have some grapevines at home or maybe an apple tree or another type of fruit tree. And it is pruning season around the Yakima Valley, so we're cutting things off. Have you ever taken a branch, cut it off, and thrown it over here into your burn pile, and then it grows grapes? No, that doesn't happen. So we have to remain connected to the, brand, to the, to the uh, stock in order to bear fruit. We can't do it on our own. I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." So right there he's saying, hey, if you're going to bear fruit, then it's pretty clear to those around you that you're my disciples. And that's how, how we can recognize other believers and other believers can recognize you. They're going to recognize us by our love and by the fruit that is being produced in our lives. The works that are being done in our lives, again, not by us and not for salvation, but through the Holy Spirit because of the faith we have in Jesus. Um, verse 9, we'll continue on. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that by my joy you may be, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than to do this, to lay down one's life. For one's friends, you are my friends if you do what I command. Um, What did I say I was going to? 17. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned came, learned from my father I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last 
And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Now, wasn't that one of the things that we just read about as, as one, of the, one of the two great commandments that he gave was to love your neighbor as yourself? Um, in the, uh, the book of Luke, I think, is where we learn about the, the story of the Good Samaritan and, and one of the, the Pharisee who asked, well, who's my neighbor? Um, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And so if, we, if people are going to recognize Christ in us by the love that he shares with them through us and the fruit that he bears in our lives, um, then we need to take an assessment of our lives and how we're living and um, think about if when someone else sees me, do they, by the Holy Spirit, see Jesus living in me? And if the answer is no, then we need to be praying to God humbly before him on our knees, asking him to remove any of those dead branches. If you, if you have a fruit tree that has um, blight, is that what it's called? Any fruit growers in here? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if it has blight, it will cause the whole tree to get sick. And then I think it can also spread to other trees. You have to cut those sick parts of the tree off, and in the same way, we need to cut those sick parts of our lives that are, are hindering us from um, being in full relationship with Christ and, and being used to his full um, glory. And, and so we need to ask him to cut those things out, throw them away, and burn them in the fire. It, um, it is not easy to have cut things cut out of your life. It's not easy to have surgery done on who you are. But the pain and the suffering that we might go through now so that we may produce more fur fruit and um, enjoy eternity with him is uh, well worth it. Whatever, what Paul says, whatever pain and suffering and tribulation you go through here, does not, it just absolutely pales in comparison to the glory that is to come in Jesus Christ in heaven. Um, so we're, we're, we're called to bear fruit, not just fluff. So we, we prune our vineyards and we prune our fruit trees because not all of these stocks are going to have buds that produce fruit. And even if they do, maybe it's just a little bit. And what they mostly have on them is leaves. And the leaves actually cause the sun to not come in uh, appropriately to the fruit, and the fruit's not as good, and it's, it doesn't get as much nutrients, so we cut it off. So it seems counterintuitive, like why are we cutting stuff off? But we cut stuff out so that we have better fruit. Um, and Jesus wants us to bear fruit, not just a bunch of leaves that do nothing. He's a, he's a good farmer, and if he's got a plant that's not producing, he doesn't want it. So it is important for us to sow the word of God in our hearts so that we may, may bear fruit. And that's, that's what James said. Don't be hearers only of the word. Don't simply just sow the word of God in your heart and then do nothing with it because that is, is useless. It's, it's pointless. If you're going to just sit here and consume, consume, consume and not share any of it, if nothing's going out, then what's, what's the point of that? We're called to make disciples. If we've, been giving some, if we've been given something that can save someone's life, we're obligated to share that. And we're obligated to bear witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, if you were dying and you had a donor with a, with a transplant and you had your life saved, you wouldn't take that second chance at life lightly. You would... Um, you would not live the same way as before because you've had, you're, you're, you're getting a second shot. And in the same way, our lives should be no different than that when we've been saved by Christ. Um, if that change has been made in us and our life has been saved, not just our life on earth, but our eternity has been saved and sealed in him, then shouldn't we act like that? Now, I want you to hear this too. This is, a, this is my church family. This is a very generous church. I have seen it through all my years here. Um, we give tons of money. We give tons of time. We uh, are very active in the community. So I don't want you to hear this and think, gosh, well, you don't even understand what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing stuff. Uh, this is not a condemnation to any of you. This is meant to be encouragement to take an assessment. If, I mean, if we have a, an exam coming up, we should give ourselves 
a little pre-exam beforehand to test ourselves. But do we, are we actually doing what we're supposed to? Um, judgment is coming, and I, I don't want any, any of us, any of, of you in my family, to come before Jesus and think I was saved, but you, you had, um, you, he, but then he says, I never knew you. Okay, so um, again, the works do not save you. The faith in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross is what saves you, but that faith should produce works. Now, are, are you going to sin um, still? Are you going to be free completely from sin? No, you're going to fall every single day. You're going to stumble, and it's, it, Paul talked about this, wrestling with it. He's like, the things that I want to do, I don't, and the things I don't want to do, I do. What a wretched man am I. And I think we have all come across that verse and said to ourselves the same thing. Like, gosh, I relate with him there. So we're not going to be perfect. But if you look at yourself today and you look at yourself before Christ, is there evidence that the Holy Spirit is living and working in you and through you? Okay? So if 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 the answer is yes, hallelujah, amen. But if the answer is no and you're like, oh, no, um, then, like I said, come before God and ask him to um, rip out some of those things in your life. And, and, and don't be too prideful to, you're like, I'm 60 years old, and for 40 years I've called myself a Christian. If I were to admit that I'm, that I'm no good, then that would be super embarrassing. You're right, maybe it would be a little embarrassing. But would you rather have a little embarrassment and spend eternity with God? Or because of your pride, say, mm, I'm going to ignore the conviction that the Holy Spirit's given me right now, and I'm just going to continue on uh, doing what I'm doing. Because I think, like, maybe I'm good enough. Maybe I've done enough good things, and the good will outweigh the bad, and I'll get to heaven. Because that's not how it works. The faith is what saves us, and the faith is also what produces the works. So here's the good news. Any good that we do, as he told us, is not from us. It's, it's through the Holy Spirit. It's from God. So... Even though we sin every day, it's just the reality of having both flesh and spirit. Because while we're here on earth, we have both of those things. So no one's going to be perfect. But Paul does tell us to run the race as one who runs to win a prize. When you're saved, praise God. But that is not the finish line. You have just qualified to enter the race. You haven't even began to run yet. You've, you've been saved and, and praise God that you have qualified to enter the race, but now you have a race to run. Um, and it's beautiful that he allows us to run the race, that he allows us to be a part of his plan, that he, in, in sharing the good news of his coming, of his righteousness, of his holiness, he allows dirty, scumbag sinners like me to share other people the good news of Jesus that he has saved us, that he has redeemed us by his sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago. So when we run, run with endurance, and as one who knows the prize that's waiting for them at the finish line. Um, In our uh, community group, we've been going through a book called The Man Code by Mark Henry. Um, this, I'm not necessarily like endorsing the book. Might be great for some people. Other people are like, "I'm a woman," um, but <laughs> but um, no, it's it's uh, it's a good book. Um, but some people could take it or leave it. Some people might really benefit from it. But this is something that we read uh, this past week that stuck out to me, and uh, it's on page two thirty four. He says, "A baby girl's world centers on herself. She delights in playing peekaboo because she's learning that others still exist." even when she doesn't see them. Out of sight, and then, surprise, mom still exists. This is amazing. Each day a child matures, her world expands further beyond herself. And for Christians, too, increased maturity means seeing a world bigger than yourself. You stop going to church services to be spiritually fed, and you start going so that you can help feed. You don't go there looking for comfort, but to comfort. You don't go to be edified, but to edify. And then an amazing thing happens. You go home fed, comforted, and edified. What happened? 
you started to love the church the way Jesus loves the church, remembering always that the church is not made of bricks and mortar and sheetrock and uh, what are the things behind the wall? Studs? Wood. Wood. It's not made of all that. It's made of people. Look around. Take a, just turn your head. Put it on a swivel. Look at all the people that we call a family here in this church. Real men love the church because Jesus loves the church is how he finishes that. If you're called to make disciples through loving God and, and through loving your neighbor, I want us to, to leave off on this, thinking about where is your mission field? Is it the office or the job site? Is it at your school? Is it by going to Mexico? And going to Mexico can be scary. I was a freshman once. I had to be convinced. And I wasn't going to leave my house because I did not use the restroom if it was not mine. Okay? Number one was fine. I've been doing that all my life. As my uncle says, the world is my urinal. Okay? But number two was a different story. I wasn't going to sit on somebody else's throne, all right? That's just dangerous stuff. But this trip was 10 days, and I, two 10 days was too long to hold. Driving all the way to Mexico was a long ways to just sit in a car. And I, and I wasn't even addicted to my phone. We had little slider phones. I had 150 texts a month, so I used them sparingly. I had one game on there. Where I was popping bubbles, and that got old pretty quick. So it was like, but I was still nervous about the drive. I was, I was talked into it. And um, I went all four years throughout high school. I went uh, again uh, when I was an intern at the church. I went again last year and then this year. If my passport arrives on time, so say a prayer, I will be going again this year. Katie informed me it should be here in time, though. But um, so it, I'm sorry, I got a tangent. Is it going to Mexico? Is it going to Guatemala with this church? Is it... Um, through giving to our gift of the world offering or just giving to the, to the regular uh, church offering? Is it by taking a Mexican flag out there and buying some loaves of bread at Costco to donate? Is it making cookies for them to take to Mexico? Um, are you being called to drop everything and, and go across the world to serve and tell people about Jesus? Maybe. And if you are, you better listen. Serving the church, maybe. Is that where your mission field could be? Um, the worship team or the tech team. Maybe children's ministry or um, maybe women's ministry or men's ministry. Worship team or tech team. Maybe it's uh, volunteering to mow the lawn. I, mean, I think a lot of times we... Um, can get, it's easy to get into a mindset where, like, ah, somebody else does it. Like, everything's operating fine, and I'm not helping, so they must have it covered. But um, the, the reality is, is that the whole reason this church is here, the reason this thing runs, is because of us. It's, we're not, it's not a commodity that we just come in and take every, every Sunday, and then we leave, and then we come back and do it again. It's something that we make happen as a way to help make disciples, to sharpen iron with more iron, to fellowship together and to worship our Creator. That's what this whole place is for. And um, without the people, this is just another building. And as the, as the American church seems to be in decline, the church in the West in general seems to be in decline, you might go to Europe and see cathedrals that are stories upon stories high, and they look really cool, but there's not really any people in them. But then you go to places like Iran, and you don't see any church buildings. And if you do, it's like, I don't want to go in there, because that's a big target on my back. But you step into some woman's house, and it's a group of ladies having a Bible study who have, who have converted from uh, Islam to Christianity because they have found the true Savior that is Jesus, that he was not just a prophet behind Muhammad, but that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and that Muhammad was just a fake. That's why the church in Iran or in Ethiopia and the Middle East in general is exploding right now 
But we are just kind of like, eh, I don't know. It's kind of a commodity. I'm looking for some better music, or I'm looking for more lights, and uh, I want a darker space where I can worship. Or the, the, the vinyl planking they stuck out in the lobby is kind of echoey for me, so I'm thinking about maybe going somewhere else. We are so blinded by our comfort and our gluttony that we forget what this is all about. We forget what makes this whole thing happen and why it happens. Worship team and tech team being volunteers. Um, the last one that I had thought of is your mission field in the mundane, same old, same old, everyday routine in your own home where you not only get to tell your spouse and your kids about the love of Jesus, but you get to show them. Man, you have a unique symbolic role as the husband to your wife, you get to play the part of Jesus in a symbolic relationship to his bride, the church. And if you are neglecting that, then you are like Moses striking the stone twice when he was only supposed to strike it once. Don't ruin the beautiful picture that God is allowing you to paint through your own broken, beat-up life. Because you are not, something that my parents have taught me, you are never going to be able to meet the needs of your wife. Wives, you're never going to be able to meet the needs of your husband. You're never going to be good enough parents to, to, to be all that your kids need. But if you allow Christ to be right in the middle of it, then through you, he will love your spouse through you. And you get to be a part of it. You get to take the credit. Wow, what a great husband he is. It's not me. It's Christ in me. And that's the kind of fruit that we need to bear. If you've stepped on a Lego too many times and you have had it, discipline is good for your kids. Don't, don't shy, shy away from the discipline, but don't shy away from loving them and showing them the love that Christ has for them because these are God's children and he's letting you raise them. They're more his than yours. And if you neglect the responsibility that he has given to you, the blessing that these children are, what a shame. Just as much as somebody in the, the Muslim-majority Middle East has never heard about Jesus, your little kids haven't heard about Jesus, except for you, maybe. And if you are the ones to be, to be the, the missional aspect of creating disciples, if you focus that right here, praise God, and you will have blessings uh, abundant because of that. So whether it's across the world or in your own home this afternoon, we as a church affirm a commitment to the whole mission of the church. We affirm not just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. Let's pray. God, um, we thank you for who you are. Uh, we thank you for the, the wonderful work that you've done in our lives. Um, and we ask humbly, recognizing that we are sinners, that you would remove all of the, the sick, uh, infested parts of our lives, the sin-filled cancer, sin cancers that get in the way of, of serving you. And take those away from us. If we don't know what they are, reveal them to us so that we can um, seek out ways to get rid of them. And so, uh, God, on behalf of this church and, and on behalf of my own life, Remove the sin from our, our hearts and allow us to be empty vessels poured out before you for your use, not for our own. And, and thank you so much for, for allowing us to do your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, in closing, I want to encourage you with the words of the Apostle Paul uh, in, at the, as he closes 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, Rejoice always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, mind you, the Apostle Paul had known comfort, and he had known distress. He'd known riches and poverty, but pray always. Don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May the God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. 
May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ. And this is the real kicker. This is the verse I love. It's a daily reminder that pops up on my phone. It says, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Those good works, they don't save you, and they're not from you. But the one who calls you to do a good work is faithful, and he will do it. All right, guys, we have Monday off, and it is 1030 on the dot. So, hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks for being here this morning. If you need prayer and want to talk, we'll have people up front.